So here's our second session on a multidisciplinary conference. Uh, this time we're going to turn the tables a little bit and see what happens when neuroradiology gets in trouble and needs to get bailed out by neurology. So let's start off with this contrast enhanced CT. Let's say I got my usual history, which is rule out pathology. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of stuck there on the history. And uh, unfortunately, there's a problem here, and we've got to figure out what's going on. Look at this area right here. This is a contrast enhanced examination, meaning that the bright things, at least the bright thing I'm pointing to here, isn't inherently dense. It's dense because it's got a lot of vascularity to it, and I'm seeing the iodinated contrast that we administered. Sure, the vessels light up. They're supposed to, right? But this is an area of brain parenchyma. It should not be bright like that. See, there's nothing on the other side. So that's abnormal enhancement within the brain. I'm looking over here, and there's more on this other cut. There are numerous tiny foci of abnormal enhancement. My differential here is going to be huge. Tumors can do this. Infections can do this. Autoimmune diseases uh, can do this. I've got this huge differential. I've got to know more about this patient so that I can narrow down why the brain parenchyma has all of these multiple foci of enhancement. So here's where I get on the phone and I say, you got to tell me what's going on with this patient. So hopefully giving you a little bit more of a history here can help to narrow down this differential. So this patient is a 27-year-old woman with a history of IV drug use who had presented with fevers, headache, and altered mental status. Uh, for the past two days. The interesting thing on her exam also, she had a murmur on uh, auscultation of her heart. Does that help? That helps a lot. That really brings it all together because one of the things that I'm worried about here, as soon as you said IV drug abuse, we were off to the races and that whole stuff about the heart, that really brings the picture together. So what happened to this lady is that she has uh, vegetations that is infected growths on the valves of her heart and those are spewing off little infected emboli that are going through her entire vascular system and some of them are landing in the brain. Turns out that's not a bad place for the, the, the bacteria to grow and what we're seeing here are little early abscesses that are scattered throughout her brain. We call these septic emboli and they are one of the classic complications of intravenous drug use. So what happens to her now? Well, that's really helpful. So we're going to draw blood cultures immediately. And in the meantime, we're going to treat her empirically with antibiotics until we can narrow down any speciation for the blood cultures. We also need to do a transesophageal echo to look at the valve to see how severely it's affected. She may require valve replacement. If that's the case, then we may have to ask for your help again uh, or interventional radiology about doing a conventional catheter-based angiogram to look for mycotic aneurysms, since that patient would need to have anticoagulation in the setting of the valve replacement. Yeah, she's in for a tough road here. How long is the, in the best case scenario, how long is she going to be on antibiotics for this? Uh, for several months. Yeah. Okay, let's switch over to MRI. This is a contrast enhanced examination, just like the other one, but now we're using a T1 weighted MRI. So this is a single cross-sectional image of a contrast enhanced T1 weighted uh, series. And you can see that there are round areas of abnormal enhancement. Here's one up here, there's one over here, there's another one back here. So the parietal and frontal lobes on both sides of the brain are affected by these round enhancing areas. Uh, could this be another example of septic emboli? I suppose they're a little big for that. Another thing to really notice is how the brain is reacting to these. The, there is edema surrounding the, uh, each of these lesions, abnormal color to the brain. That's not on this side abnormal brain from the edema surrounding each of them. So that gives me a little bit of a clue, but I'm still kind of stuck just like last time. I don't know whether this is an infection or a tumor or autoimmune disease. I, once again, I need to know some history to, to clue me in on what's going on. Well, maybe this can help to narrow things down. So this was a 48-year-old woman with a history of thyroid cancer that was diagnosed a little over a year ago. At that time, it had re been recommended to her to undergo thyroidectomy but she didn't schedule it, unfortunately, because her husband had amassed some medical debt for his own medical issues, and she was worried about the cost. So nobody's really seen her since that time. She then came to me with a month of new headaches, and I was worried about something focal on her, uh, on her imaging because on her exam, she had a left field cut in her visual field and a left facial droop as well. 
Well, that, that helps a lot. This is untreated thyroid cancer, and now we know exactly what's going on. These are metastases that have spread to the brain, and that explains why she's got so much edema. Metastases are really good at inducing edema in the surrounding brain. They really irritate the brain a lot. So that explains why, even though these aren't particularly large lesions, maybe a couple centimeters, the uh, abnormality extends for far distances beyond that. I think we can explain why she's got some areas of weakness when we think about the motor cortex here in the posterior frontal lobe. Uh, and uh, we can imagine that, that these, these lesions, if, if the edema st extends a little bit lower, that that's going to hit her occipital lobes. So I think we have a good explanation for all the neurologic uh, findings on her. Um, and, and now we know for sure what's going on. We might want to biopsy one of these to be absolutely sure, but it's already a pretty good picture. What happens to her now? Well, so we'll see what neurosurgery thinks about uh, taking out any of the tissue to confirm diagnosis, as well as for some symptomatic relief as well, given the significant vasogenic edema with the right, that one right-sided lesion. Uh, she's going to need to be evaluated by oncology as well. Yep. Hopefully, as you look at these lesions, you're starting to sense the theme of this lecture. Here's another contrast enhanced examination, another MRI, and you can see that there are enhancing lesions on the right side of the brain in the parietal and occipital lobes. When we talk about enhancing lesions, we like to describe the pattern of enhancement. This enhancement around the outside without the inside being involved, we call that rim enhancement. And there's a lot of different things that cause rim enhancement. So I'm kind of stuck with the same differential diagnosis I had before. If we're really careful, I think I can say there's a couple more dots, like one right there, one right there, one right there, one right here. So there are smaller lesions scattered throughout the entire brain, but a couple of really big ones here in the posterior right cerebrum. I'm stuck in the same place I was in the last two examinations. Without some clinical history, I've got nowhere to go from here. Yeah, so this is a 52-year-old male uh, with a history of HIV who has had some difficulty getting his antiretroviral uh, therapy regimen, who came to me with these episodes of what he called strobe lights in his vision, just off to the left, lasting a couple minutes at a time, Initially, his primary doctor uh, thought they were migraines, but he hasn't responded to any migraine medications, and he really had no headache with them either. So does that help at all to narrow things down? You know, about 20 years ago, we would see cases like this all the time, but with modern medications, patients with HIV just don't get these sorts of complications anymore. Um, th this guy has untreated HIV, uh, he has probably AIDS, and this is one of the complications. These rim-enhancing lesions in the setting of an immunocompromised patient, like an AIDS patient, are one of two things. They're either lymphoma, which has a weird appearance in HIV patients with this rim enhancement, or they're an infection caused, called toxoplasmosis. The multiplicity and the scattering all around the brain is a little more suggestive of toxoplasmosis. How are we going to figure out whether this is lymphoma or toxo? So what we'll do is we'll get a sample of a CSF and check for toxoplasma antigen, uh, toxoplasmosis antigen, and we will also check a, uh, a titer and a serum as well. My suspicion is likewise that it's probably toxo, in which case we'll have to begin treatment with antimicrobial sulfadiazine and pyrimethamine, and depending on how he responds, he may be on it indefinitely. Yeah, you can, you, if you want to differentiate between tumor and infection, you can treat the infection, and if it goes away, it was an infection. If not, then you got to start uh, moving towards tumor treatment. Okay, here's another MRI, T1-weighted post-contrast, this time in the coronal plane. Uh, we can think about some of the coronal anatomy, how the temporal lobes are sitting out here, insulating this little piece of brain right there called, appropriately, the insula. Um, so here are, again, multiple enhancing lesions with that rim pattern of enhancement all the way around the outside. Just a couple of lesions this time, but I have exactly the same uh, differential I had on every case so far. Need that clinical history. Yeah, so this is a bit different. This is a younger, 34-year-old woman with a family history of multiple autoimmune disorder. Her mother has systemic lupus erythematosus. Her sister has Hashimoto's thyroiditis. 
She's presenting now with two months of headache and mild left-sided weakness. So what do you think? So now we're headed towards one of these autoimmune categories. She's got a strong family history that suggests autoimmune disease. And the one that most frequently affects the white matter of the brain is, of course, of course multiple sclerosis. We don't think of that as being a mass-like lesion. We think of lots of little lesions extending out from the edge of the ventricles. But sometimes these patients present with a single or maybe two, like this case, rim-enhancing lesions that are the first manifestation of their multiple sclerosis. Sometimes these rims have these rim, the rim of the rim enhancing lesion has a particular pattern where it doesn't enhance all the way around and there's a little gap on the medial aspect and that can be a clue. But sometimes it looks like this and there's no clues at all. It looks just like all the other enhancing lesions. So this is autoimmune disease. This is multiple sclerosis with an unusual but well described form of presentation. We, because these look so much like tumors, we call this tumefactive multiple sclerosis. So she's probably used to this uh, sort of diagnosis from her family history, but what's she in for? Yeah, so we're gonna do a lumbar puncture to look for an elevated IgG index in all the clonal bands. Although often in tumefactive multiple sclerosis, the CSF is benign. Um, it, is, it can be monophasic, though many patients do go on to develop uh, primary, or excuse me, relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis. Right now, while we're working her up with the lumbar puncture, waiting for those results, we'll treat her with IV methylprednisolone and we'll monitor her. Okay, here's a case where I might have a little more of a clue what's going on. It looks a little different from those last few. Once again, this is an axial post-contrast T1-weighted image through the brain, just a little skim in the top of the lateral ventricles here. And this is an unusual configuration for an, an enhancing mass. Now, this type of enhancement is very different from that rim enhancement that we saw before. Here, there are ribbons of enhancement running all the way through the mass. The edge is not nearly as well defined, and except for maybe this little bit right here, there's not a ring of enhancement around the whole object. So we, we would call this a heterogeneous enhancement pattern rather than a rim enhancement pattern. There's another really important aspect of, of this lesion, and that's its anatomic location. So think for a second about what anatomic location is being traversed by this tumor. This is the anterior aspect of the corpus callosum the genu of the corpus callosum, and maybe up into the anterior body of the corpus callosum. That's why it's able to spread from one side of the brain to the other, right? The corpus callosum is what connects one hemisphere to the other, and this lesion is tracking right along the corpus callosum. There's not a lot of things that track along the corpus callosum. Um, mostly, it requires a tumor to do that. So what sort of presentation gets us to this point? So this was an interesting presentation. This is a 56-year-old man who has had some progressive personality changes. And his wife is actually a psychologist and was worried that he may be developing a form of frontotemporal dementia, which is why she brought him to my office initially. I can tell you that other than this recent problem with his personality changes, being more socially inappropriate and impulsive, he otherwise is healthy. He doesn't take any medications. He has no history of substance abuse or tobacco use. He doesn't have any history of diabetes or any other immune suppressive disorders. Well, he, he went from nothing to some serious problems in a hurry here. Um, that we can really explain the personality change as well. You can see that there's some edema spreading into the frontal lobe right here. And with this bifrontal pattern, uh, you can imagine the sorts of personality changes that would occur. So the two tumors that cross the corpus callosum like this are lymphoma and glioblastoma. Glioblastoma is the most aggressive of the primary brain tumors. And this heterogeneous enhancement pattern is much more consistent with a glioblastoma. Lymphoma, on the other hand, would have a very uniform enhancement pattern. It could have this same spread across the corpus callosum, but a much more uniform enhancement. 
when we see a glioblastoma that is crossing the corpus callosum, it usually gets a little narrower as it crosses and then spreads out into the surrounding brain. And that's called a butterfly pattern of enhancement. And that's why we refer to these as butterfly gliomas. It's a devastating diagnosis. What happens to them now? Well, so I'm going to ask my neurosurgical colleagues if they would be able to do either a biopsy or resection as close to gross total as they can. It's a tricky location. Following that, if it confirms the diagnosis of glioblastoma, he'll require neoadjuvant uh, treatment with chemotherapy and radiation therapy. Yeah, tough road, and unfortunately, not usually a long road. These are very aggressive tumors. Okay. If you think that this picture looks a lot like the picture I just showed, but in a different location, that's because it does. This is another T1-weighted post-contrast MRI uh, through the middle of the brain, and we can see here, we're at the top of the ventricles, we're up in the parietal lobe here, we can see an area of heterogeneous enhancement. There's no well-defined rim around the outside. The whole thing is enhancing, but not uniformly. There's areas of enhancement, ribbons of enhancement, and areas of non-enhancement in the center. Looks a whole, like that, a whole lot like that glioblastoma, and totally could be, except I'm not really seeing all of that edema. Uh, there's no, it's not pushing on the surrounding sulci and brain the way that, 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 glio, that, that glioblastoma did. This is, uh, this is probably something different, but what could this be? I, I need some sort of guidance here. I need some history. Yeah, so hopefully this can help narrow things down. This is a 72-year-old man with a history of atrial fibrillation. This history was obtained from his wife. According to her, 10 days ago, he developed this acute onset confusion. She took him to her local ER that day. He had a non-contrast head CT that was reportedly normal. Unfortunately, I don't have those images. He had a couple of whites in his urinalysis, and so he was treated for a UTI. But his wife says he just hasn't really been himself since, and I just got the urine culture results from the outside lab, and his urine culture grew mixed flora. On my exam, he was a little confused, but he was also neglectful of his left side. Okay, confused and neglecting his left side, and a negative head CT. Well, the thing that, that we're going to be most concerned about here in a patient with atrial fibrillation is that he had a stroke. In patients with atrial fibrillation often form clots within their uh, atria, or sometimes ventricles, and they can throw those clots off, and if they happen to go up into the arterial system into the brain, they'll cause an ischemic stroke. Now, how does that get us to enhancement? You'd think that if someone had a stroke, they'd have less blood going to that area of the brain, and so they would have less enhancement, not more enhancement. That doesn't make a lot of sense. But it turns out that as a stroke is healing, the clot will slowly dissolve by normal mechanisms in the blood, and then when it disappears, there will suddenly be a rush of blood into the in, into that section of brain. This does a couple of things. One thing is that it can cause a hemorrhage because the vessels in that area of brain are not ready for that rush and their endothelium is injured by the stroke. And that's what we call hemorrhagic transformation when you get a hemorrhage into an ischemic stroke. But another thing that happens is that the blood-brain barrier that normally stops the gadolinium contrast agent from weeping into the brain has been injured. And so the gadolinium can, can uh, leak into the brain and cause enhancement. It's an odd situation that you would have enhancement in the setting of a stroke, but this is a subacute stroke. Remember that his actual event was a week or two ago, and now we're in the subacute healing phase, so we often see enhancement in that situation. Well, I think we're out of the window where we can treat his acute stroke, so what can we do for him? Well, now our goal is going to be on preventing any further stroke. So we are going to put him uh, on anticoagulation to prevent any further embolic events, since his likely mechanism was cardioembolic related to his atrial fibrillation. These right parietal strokes can look for all the world like nonspecific delirium. So part of it is going to be getting him on a good rehab regimen, a cognitive rehab and a physical rehab to uh, help to get him back to a more independent state. 
uh, we'll check his lipids, check an A1C, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to prevent any further events down the road. Here's another contrast enhanced MRI, T1 weighted. We're up near the top of the brain now. And here's one, two, three lesions involving both hemispheres. We're back to that rim enhancing pattern with enhancements around the outside and, and not much in the middle. And we're back to that same problem of a broad differential diagnosis. This could be a lot of different things. Clinical history to the rescue. So this is a 27 year old man who came to me after recently returning from living abroad in Central America for a few years, pursuing some research on local plant life there. He came to me for new onset seizures and he has no family history of seizures, no history of febrile convulsions as a child. He was a normal birth and development. So this kind of came out of the blue for him. Yeah, seizures out of the blue, that's a pretty disturbing symptom. And surely any of the lesions that we have shown in this lecture could cause seizures, but these aren't causing a lot of edema around them. In fact, shockingly little edema um, for the sorts of things we'd be considering. Now, when we talk about international travel and coming back from spending a couple of years in Central America, we really get worried about unusual, atypical infections. And one of the ones that we get worried about a lot in the brain is called sister sarcosis. Sister sarcosis is sometimes even easier to identify on an unenhanced CT scan like this one because of the way that it calcifies. You can see just innumerable tiny calcifications scattered throughout the entire brain once you, once you bring out the CT. This is a classic appearance for this particular infection, sister sarcosis. How did you manage to pick this up? So you can get it from drinking contaminated water, and we do know that it is the most common cause of epilepsy in the developing world. So in light of this scan, this doesn't surprise me. Yeah, and the lack of edema surrounding these lesions is also pretty characteristic. So now what happens to him? Well, so I am gonna send him to ophthalmology to take a good look at his eyes because these patients can also develop ocular cystocercosis as well. He very well may require antiparasitic therapy. I know that often patients who have older calcified lesions because the antiparasitic uh, antibio uh, therapies don't get into the calcifications, it's often not useful. But for some of those newer ones that are enhancing, it may help to alleviate some of his symptoms. All right, now we have a coronal MRI. It's pretty uh, anterior in location because we're getting some orbit here as well as some frontal lobes. Uh, this again is a post-contrast T1 weighted image and you can see that there is an enhancing lesion here in the white matter of the frontal lobe. Um, uh, once again, I'm gonna need something to help guide me. So, this should help a lot. This is a 32-year-old woman with a history of relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis who presented with three days of decreasing, decreasing visual acuity in the left eye and pain with eye movements on the left. On my exam, she had a left relative afferent pupillary defect. Uh, well, that makes this cloud. Now that you say that, I can really see the, the problem in the orbit as well as the problem in the brain. This is what the optic nerve should look like, and her optic nerve is enhancing way more than it ought to. We call that optic neuritis, and it is closely associated with multiple sclerosis. About half of people who present with optic neuritis end up at some point with a diagnosis of multiple sclerosis, and about half of people with multiple sclerosis presented with optic neuritis. So they are closely, closely associated. When I see the optic neuritis, the inflamed optic nerve, as well as a rounded inflammatory lesion in the brain itself, I know that we're dealing with multiple sclerosis. There really isn't any differential diagnosis. Another thing I know is that because this lesion is enhancing and not just abnormal white matter, that enhancement indicates that the disease is active and that the suppression mechanisms that we're using, the, the, the medicines that we're using are not working because she has active demyelination and is being acutely injured by this disease. So how can we suppress that? Well, so we'll treat her acutely with IV methylprednisolone. And then once she recovers to baseline, we're gonna to have to consider whether or not to change her disease modifying therapy. Uh, she's currently on a, an interferon, but maybe starting something like uh, 
Tysabri or natalizumab for prevention of future attacks may be helpful. This is a somewhat different pattern of enhancement than the ones we've seen so far. Uh, once again, we have a post-contrast T1 weighted MRI, and you can see sort of wispy areas of enhancement that are affecting the white matter, right? wispy enhancement. While this could be an effect of multiple sclerosis, it isn't really the patterns of multiple sclerosis we've seen so far. It's not like that rounded tumefactive multiple sclerosis. It's not like the nodular area that we saw in the last patient. These are wispy, ill-defined areas of enhancement exclusive to the white matter. So uh, what else could this be? Well, so this is a 23-year-old man who presented with new onset headache, left-sided weakness and confusion. Really, most of this history I got from his girlfriend because he was uh, really not feeling up to giving much of a history and was a bit confused. She said that he had a cold a week before. Uh, his symptoms specifically were sore throat, cough, and some body aches. So what do you think? That history of having a cold a week before is surprisingly useful. What we're looking at here is acute demyelination, and that's why it's restricted to the white matter. That demyelination can come from a variety of sources. It can be autoimmune, like the, uh, like the MS patients we're looking at. It can be infectious in some cases, but it can also be sort of a cross between those, a post-infectious autoimmune attack. Sometimes people get infected with uh, bacteria and the antibodies that they produce actually attack their normal myelin and they get something that is a lot like multiple sclerosis, but it's related to that recent illness. We call that acute disseminated encephalomyelitis or ADEM, and this is a pretty classic appearance for ADEM. How do we treat that? Well, we treat similar to the way we treat other autoimmune demyelinating disorders, and that's with IV steroids acutely. Typically, ADEM or ADEM is monophasic, though in adults it can relapse more commonly than it does in children. So we'll have to keep an eye on him. Recovery can also be less complete in adults than it is in children. So, but in the short time, or short term, we'll treat him with IV steroids and monitor him for improvement. But hopefully, he'll get back all the way to normal with a little luck. Hopefully. It's another axial T1-weighted post-contrast MRI of the brain, but this time we have a very different pattern of enhancement. Here we have these two straight lines of abnormal enhancement extending straight forward from the lateral aspect of the pons. That's kind of a weird enhancement pattern because it's running right through the cistern. Why would that fluid enhance? We're going to rely on our anatomy, though, and remember that what object runs straight forward from the lateral aspect of the pons. It's the fifth cranial nerve, and that's coming straight forward into Meckel's cave on either side. So what we're seeing here is enhancement of the, of the fifth cranial nerves themselves. What gets us that? So this is a 25-year-old man who presented to my office with right facial pain and facial droop for the past week. And then over the past day, he noted that his left side started to become painful as well of his face. On review systems, he also reports new pain in his left knee and these shooting pains in his lower back, which I found kind of strange since he's a young man. He does say that he works outside a lot and actually found a tick in his hair about a month ago. Well, if you hadn't offered that history about the outdoorsy nature and the tick, I was going to ask about it because there is a particular infection that goes along well with that history. It's a tick-borne disease that people who are outdoors a lot get called Lyme disease. Characteristically, Lyme disease will cause enhancement of cranial nerves once it reaches the CNS. And this is a pretty characteristic pattern. It explains the bilaterality really well, and it explains his facial pain because we know that the fifth cranial nerves are responsible for sensation to the face. So can we help him out? Absolutely. So we'll put him on a course of PO doxycycline for 28 days, and I suspect he should do very well. Have we explained his knee pain and his back pain? Yeah, actually, I think we really have. It's very common to have oligoarthritis and polyradiculitis as a symptom complex along with these cranial nerve palsies with Lyme disease. All right, we'd better throw in something other than a brain here. This is an MRI of the cervical spine. 
The first image is a post-contrast T1 weighted image, and the second image is a T2 weighted image. We're still focusing on enhancement, and sure enough, there is a segment of enhancement running through the middle of the cervical spinal cord. It's actually the cord itself that's enhancing here. Our T2 weighted image shows us all of the edema surrounding that. So there is a, a, a segment of abnormal cervical cord here with edema and abnormal enhancement. I've got some ideas here, but the clinical history is going to uh, really lock it in for me. So this is a 24-year-old woman with no significant past medical history who developed neck pain and bilateral arm tingling followed by weakness over the course of the past day and a half. She has a history of rheumatoid arthritis in her mother. Otherwise, she herself carries no previous medical issues. She's not a smoker. She doesn't use any illicit drugs. Well, that's really helpful. This pattern of enhancement here, this vague pattern of enhancement over a short segment is really characteristic of an inflammatory disease called transverse myelitis. Could this be a tumor that's affecting the spinal cord or the edema around it? That could certainly happen, but it tends to be a pattern of enhancement that has more heterogeneous, like that glioblastoma we were looking at on earlier slides, and not this vague uh, enhancement that we're seeing in this case. So hopefully we're dealing with a case of, uh, of transverse myelitis here. What, uh, what, what can we do for her? Yeah, so I'd like to get more information. I'd like to sample her CSF. I'd like to send it for the what we call the MS battery, checking an IgG index and all the clonal bands. Transverse myelitis can be idiopathic, but you can see it in the setting of multiple sclerosis as well. While this lesion isn't as long, uh, of course, Dr. Branson, you can correct me, but though this, this lesion isn't as long as what we see in typical NMO, neuromyelitis optica, it is on the differential when something presents with new onset transverse myelitis. So we'll send the aquaporin for antibody. We'll also send the anti-MOG antibody. And Lyme disease can also cause a myelitis, so we'll check her for Lyme as well. As long as her CSF doesn't show any signs of infection, we'll treat her empirically with IV steroids until we get more information. If this is just a viral transverse myelitis, how will she do? So I expect that she'll recover. It can just take some time. Well, finally, a case with some good news to close it out. That's the end of our second case conference. The first one was devoted to how neuroradiology can solve problems for neurology. This one more devoted to how neurology solves problems for neuroradiology.